I'd like to thank the Institute for National Security Studies for inviting me here this evening. Uh, this is an appropriate venue to speak about our shared vision uh, for a more stable and secure Middle East. And I thank you for your contributions to the public discourse uh, on this and many other important security issues. I have made <clears throat> many trips to Israel uh, since first coming a decade ago, but this is my first visit to INSS. The bond between the United States and Israel is based on shared principles. <clears throat> we are committed to democracy and the rule of law, to promoting essential freedoms and, protect, and to protecting human rights. We show fidelity to these principles by a consistent willingness to defend them and to take action. Israel is a country that takes action. This is an underappreciated virtue in diplomacy. President Trump and Secretary Pompeo understand the importance of our alliance, which is why under their leadership, it is as strong as it has ever been. <clears throat> President Trump recently made the decision to move the US Embassy to Jerusalem and recognize it as Israel's capital. This had been promised by previous presidents, but never done. President Trump also said is enough is enough when it comes to the structurally flawed and biased UN Human Rights Council. He took a stand against anti-Semitism by withdrawing from the UN Human Rights Council. And finally, in May, President Trump decided to end our participation in the Iran nuclear deal. This administration is committed to reversing the balance of power in the Middle East in favor of our friends and partners. This is why President Trump has made countering Iran a top priority. The regime in Iran seeks hegemony and stands as one of the great obstacles to a more secure Israel. This evening, I want to discuss this administration's policy toward Iran and update you on the progress Secretary Pompeo is making to execute the President's vision. Israel is on the front lines of the fight against Iran's dangerous expansionism. Even now, rockets rain down on Israel from Gaza, a territory controlled by Iran's Palestinian partner, Hamas. As always, the United States condemns these attacks and reaffirms our support of the Israeli people. The threat to Israel posed by Iran's violent misadventures demands action, not only for Israel's sake, but also for the sake of stability in the Middle East. President Trump has said the United States will act. He withdrew the United States from the Iran deal because he could not continue to waive sanctions on Iran while the regime expanded its threats to peace and security. The Obama administration gave the Iranian regime the deal of a lifetime to choose a better course, and the Iranians blew it. They could have taken the billions and billions of dollars in sanctions relief and invested in their own people. Instead, they poured it into foreign wars abroad, funding Shia militias, all of which violated the Iran deal's promise to promote regional to contribute to regional peace and stability. We really shouldn't be surprised that Iran chose the wrong path. Why would Iran spend less money on terrorism when given more money to spend on terrorism? The Iran deal gave the regime strategic cover to operate with greater freedom and flexibility. Paradoxically, it constrained our ability to respond to Iran's provocations enabled by the deal. Iran expanded its range of threats during the negotiation and implementation of the Iran nuclear deal. Thanks to Israel's bold handiwork inside of Tehran, we know that Iran secretly retained a half a ton of nuclear weaponization files, a vast atomic archive. The existence of the archive is a kind of confession by the regime about its endgame. Those who dismissed the discovery of the archive as old news are, to paraphrase Samuel Johnson, 
listening with credulity to the whispers of fancy. It is our assessment that under the deal, the regime continued and accelerated many of its destabilizing policies. Its backing of terrorism and assistance to terrorist proxies grew, its missile development increased, and its role in regional conflicts deepened. I want to discuss the trend lines we are seeing in each of these areas and explain the actions we are taking. Iran actively supports several terrorist groups designated by the United States, providing them funding, training, weapons, and equipment. Among the groups receiving support from Iran today are Lebanese Hezbollah, Hamas, Palestine, uh, Islamic Jihad, Kataib Hezbollah in Iraq, and Al-Ashtar brigades in Bahrain. Hezbollah is Iran's most powerful terrorist partner and Iran's financial backing to the terrorist group, a staggering $700 million a year, accounts for the majority of its annual budget. Iran also provides up to $100 million annually to Palestinian terror groups. These groups are actively targeting Israel with indiscriminate rocket fire. While Iran's support for terrorist proxies furthers its own corrupt interests, it comes at a deep cost to the Palestinian people's security and prosperity. Despite Iran's claim to support the Palestinian people, the regime invests far more in bombs than in bread. Since 1994, the United States has provided $6.3 billion in aid to support the Palestinian people. Iran, on the other hand, has provided just $20,000 through UNRWA from 2008 to 2017. Hamas acts the exact same way. Although claiming to advocate on behalf of the Palestinian people, Hamas spends vast sums on weapons of terror when it should be investing in the well-being of its own people. It is no surprise that under its authority, Gaza is being driven into the ground in much the same way the Iranian regime is driving Iran into the ground. Since the regime in Iran came to power in 1979, it has conducted terrorist plots, assassinations, and attacks in more than 20 countries across five continents. This activity has continued under the deal. In the last six months alone, Two high-profile Iran-backed terror plots were foiled in Denmark and France, laying bare Iran's complete disregard for international norms and standards. Under the nuclear deal, Iran has also forged ahead with its missile development and proliferation activities. The United States can confirm that Iran's pace of missile launches did not diminish after implementation of the Iran deal in January of 2016. Iran has conducted multiple ballistic missile launches since this time, as it continues to prioritize its missile development. We assess that in January 2017, Iran launched a medium-range missile believed to be the Karam Shar. It is designed to sustain a payload of more than 1,500 kilograms and could carry nuclear warheads. Iran now has the largest ballistic missile force in the region, with more than 10 ballistic missile systems, either in its inventory or in development. Iran has increased efforts to put more of its weapons into the hands of more of its proxies. Credible reports indicate that Iran is transferring ballistic missiles to Shia militias in Iraq. In Lebanon, Iran is helping Hezbollah to build missile production facilities and has supplied the terrorist group with thousands of precision rockets, missiles, and small arms. Iran is providing ballistic missiles to the Houthis in Yemen. Analysis of debris recovered from a November 2017 strike close to Riyadh's international airport indicates that the missile was of Iranian origin. As Iran support of terrorism grows and its proliferation of missile technologies continues, it is also deepening its role in regional conflicts. Iran has spent billions since 2016 to
to prop up the Assad regime and support its other proxies in Iraq, Syria, and Yemen. Iran's involvement in regional conflicts has made it worse, increasing humanitarian suffering and preventing the potential for peace. Iran currently has as many as 2,500 soldiers on the ground in Syria, including IRGC ground forces and Artesh, Iran's conventional army. It also coordinates as many as 10,000 Iraqi, Afghan, and Pakistani Shia fighters in the country. Iran has spent hundreds of millions of dollars assisting the Houthis in Yemen. Tehran's provision of aid to the Houthi rebels, including unmanned aerial vehicles, explosive boat technology, and missile technology, has needlessly intensified an already tragic conflict. In Iraq, Iran has backed Shia militia groups and uses them to drive a sectarian wedge between Shia and Sunni communities. These militias were behind the life-threatening and provocative attacks on U.S. diplomatic facilities recently in Baghdad and Basra, which Iran did nothing to stop. In light of this evidence, it is clear that the Iran deal failed to meet its mark. By withdrawing from the deal, we have made it clear that the United States will not reward the Iranian regime so long as its rogue policies remain in place. We need to see fundamental changes in the regime's behavior before we consider a new deal. Secretary Pompeo has laid out a clear vision of what these changes should look like and has outlined, outlined 12 key requirements that Iran must meet. These should not come as a surprise to anyone because they are based largely on the global consensus that existed prior to the Iran nuclear deal. They include, among others, Iran declaring a full account of the prior military dimensions of its nuclear program and permanently and verifiably abandoning such work. We will never permit Iran to obtain a nuclear weapon. Iran should end its proliferation of ballistic missiles and halt further launching or development of nuclear-capable missile systems. Iran should respect the sovereignty of the Iraqi government and permit the disarming, the demobilization, and reintegration of Shia militias. Iran should end support to Middle East terrorist groups, including Lebanese Hezbollah, Hamas, and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. And Iran must end its military support for the Houthi militia and work toward a peaceful political settlement in Yemen. Until we see a change in the Iranian regime's uh, policies consistent with the 12 requirements that Secretary Pompeo laid out, we will continue our campaign of maximum economic and diplomatic pressure. As part of this campaign <clears throat> on November 5th, the United States reimposed the remaining sanctions that were lifted by the Iran deal. In the largest ever single-day action targeting the Iranian regime, sanctions went back into place on more than 700 individuals, entities, vessels, and aircraft. This includes the National Iranian Oil Company, the National Iranian Tanker Company, the Islamic Republic of Iran shipping lines, as well as key financial institutions like Bank Meli, Bank Melat, and Bank Tejarat. Our sanctions will cut off access to the critical funding streams that the Iranian regime needs to bankroll its destructive activities. Our sanctions will also restrict designated Iranian oil tankers from accessing insurance on the international market, leading Iran to turn to self-insurance. If there is an incident involving a self-insured Iranian tanker, there is simply no way <clears throat> that Iranian insurance providers can cover the costs. As I warned last week, Iranian tankers are now a floating liability, and countries, port operators, and private firms should be on notice. Sanctions on Iran's energy sector are especially critical to our pressure campaign because up to 80 percent of the regime's revenues come from oil exports. In the last six months, 
we reduce, we reduced Iran's crude exports by more than one million barrels while maintaining adequate oil supply and keeping prices stable. This massive reduction is three to five times more than many analysts were projecting when President Trump announced our withdrawal from the deal in May. We exceeded expectations for one simple reason. Maximum pressure means maximum pressure. We are committed to a calibrated approach that maintains an adequately supplied oil market while getting importers of Iranian crude to zero as quickly as possible. We will continue this maximum pressure campaign until the regime stops being a force for instability and terror. That is why I am announcing today that the United States has designated four Hezbollah-affiliated individuals who lead and coordinate the group's operational, intelligence, and financial activities in Iraq. All four of these individuals will be, designate, will be added to the specially designated global terrorist list as a result of their activities in support of Hezbollah's designating uh, destabilizing operations in Iraq. The United States monitors Iran-backed terror groups like Hezbollah closely, and we will continue to take action to disrupt their destabilizing activities on behalf of Iran. Later today, the State Department will be announcing additional, additional designations, <clears throat> including of an organization active in the Gaza Strip. Our pressure campaign is aimed squarely at the regime and not the Iranian people. Secretary Pompeo has made it clear that the United States stands with them as they call on their government to change its destructive policies, stop squandering their money on foreign wars, and respect human rights. The United States does not sanction humanitarian goods or the sale of food, agricultural commodities, medicine, or medical devices. It has never been our policy to target humanitarian trade with Iran. The regime's attempts to mischaracterize our very clear humanitarian exemptions are a hollow effort to distract from its own corruption and mismanagement. I have heard some say that Secretary, Secretary Pompeo's 12 demands are, are too many and that our pressure is too much. They say that the United States should come to the table with a more realistic understanding of the terms that Iran would be willing to accept, and that now is not the time to be pressuring the regime. We disagree. It is this kind of flawed thinking that has allowed Iran to become such a destructive force in the Middle East and beyond. In the face of overt acts of Iranian terrorism, countries have been too content to look the other way. When presented with evidence of Iran's proliferation activities, they have been too eager to rationalize away the regime's actions. This complacency has created unacceptably low expectations of the regime in Tehran. If the demands we have laid out are too many, it is because Iran's destructive activities are too numerous. If our demands are too unrealistic, it is because the world's expectations have hit rock bottom. But we cannot simply admire the Iranian threat any longer. The United States and Israel are now united in this. We are united in this view and bound by a shared commitment to strengthen the region's security architecture. Israel's interests and those of its neighbors will be best served when every country in the region, especially the regime in Tehran, respects the rule of law, abides by fundamental standards and commitments, and disjoins terrorism from foreign policy. If the regime makes these changes, a brighter future await the Iranian people. History tells us clearly that America has no permanent enemies. Throughout our history, enemies torn apart by conflict have often become allies united in peace. This same future can exist for the Iranian people, but it is up to the Supreme Leader to make this bold decision. It should not be a difficult choice. There is nothing noble about leading a, a great nation into the ground. The Iranian people 
with their rich legacy and vibrant culture, deserve to be more than a regional pariah. But rest assured that our maximum pressure campaign will continue until Iran addresses our concerns and makes the principal decision to respect the rule of law and to reject terrorism. Anything short of this will fail to achieve our objective of a more stable and secure Middle East. Thank you again for inviting me to speak with you this evening. Um, so we're open now from, for questions from you, and we also have maybe some questions from the media as well. Uh, Shlomo, would you like to start? Yes, I think that uh, you made a very clear uh, presentation of the, the, the US policy. So I think we cannot uh, argue that we don't understand it very clear. So it's very clear what is your purpose. But then, as usual, the question rises. What happens if it doesn't work according to your script? which is putting pressure on Iran, Iran comes back to the negotiation table and you get a better agreement. My impression from studying the Iranian party and also for, based on meetings with Iranians mm -hmm. from Iran, is that they think that they can weather the US pressure mm -hmm. because it will be for a limited time because there are only two years for the, the, the Trump administration, and then the, 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 there is a good chance that he will not be re-elected. So do you have a plan B? If it doesn't work, Iran is not coming back to mm -hmm. the negotiation table. Mm -hmm. well, there's a lot of hypotheticals in that question. Um, we, we like uh, the position that we're in. Uh, I've studied the, uh, I, w I was, uh, uh, when I was in the UN Security Council in 2006, uh, was one of the negotiators of the first uh, multilateral sanctions resolution on Iran. You had a sanctions architecture that was built up from 2006 until 2013 or 2014. Um, we, will, we will compress that time frame dramatically. We're starting from a much stronger foundation than we did in 2006. Um, at that time, oil was quite high. The rial was stable. Um, now, the rial has lost 75% of its value this year. They have had capital flight. They have had a complete collapse in foreign direct um, investment. Um, we have taken off a million barrels of oil from 2.7 to 1.6, and a lot more is coming off the market. 80% of their revenues come from oil exports. And um, we've already, that's already $2 billion in lost revenue. We will be very aggressively enforcing the sanctions regime. I think the last administration, the escrow accounts, and just the sort of the general enthusiasm for enforcing the sanctions, I think we have a much stronger spirit for it. And so we will be um, ensuring that the escrow accounts, that there's no leakage. We will be uh, tracking all Iranian oil tankers. And uh, even when they turn off their transponders. And so we think that uh, Iran faces enormous economic headwinds and more are to come now that our sanctions are back in place. And we think that the, uh, that concentrated economic pressure uh, will be sufficient for Iran to come back to the negotiating table. That's our assessment of it. Uh, we just think that, that, that we were in a much better position than the last administration was. It took them three years. So by one data point, it took the Obama administration, they started from, I don't know, 2.2, 2 2.3 million, and they brought Iran down to, I think, a low of around 1.2. Um, we will achieve that in a very short period of time. about the Iranian intervention in Syria. Because at the beginning of this year, both uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and Defense Minister Lieberman said separately that the Iranian military intervention in Syria is the most important security problem that Israel faces alongside the nuclear issue, of course. And they repeated this uh, statement. And I, I would agree with them. 
because uh, Iran is trying to use Syria not only to support the Assad regime, but also to create a second front in addition to Lebanon toward Israel. Now, this is the reason also why the Israeli Air Force is attacking time and again Iranian and Shiite targets mm -hmm. in Syria and its neighborhood, quite successfully. Mm -hmm. But it's not enough. Because it is clear that the aim of Iran is to stay in Syria as much as you can. They don't want to leave Syria. That's right. And uh, the question is, if this is not enough, the Israeli attacks of the Iranians will not convince Iran to, to leave. And this pressure is also has become an also domestic problem for the Iranians because masses of Iranians are demanding for the Iranian regime to take the money from Syria and from Palestine and from uh, Lebanon and to bring it back to the Iranian people. But mm -hmm. it doesn't work. The question is what the Trump administration is can and willing to do in order to push the Iranian outside. Yeah. I just want to <coughs> more because uh, I think it was uh, Secretary of Face, uh, American Secretary of Face, who said that one of the reasons of the re resumption of the, of the sanction was to let Iran have less money invested in, the, in these countries, including in, in, in Syria. It's not enough. The question is, what is plan B if the Israeli attack and hmm. American pressures don't work? Uh, I think we completely share your threat assessment in terms of the how critical it is to not permit uh, the Lebanization of Syria. And uh, Israel has done, uh, I think uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has done a very good job of deterring Iran uh, in Syria. And we are going to be, one of the levers that we have, and, and now I'm kind of moving into Ambassador Jim Jeffrey's space, our, he's our special envoy for Syria. We have uh, reconstruction assistance that we can withhold. Um, there is no way that Assad can rebuild his country on his own, and we don't think that China or Russia can do it themselves either. And so um, reconstruction assistance, denying any, reconstru any reconstruction assistance to territory held by the Assad regime is, a, um, is some leverage that we have. Uh, legitimacy is also important. Um, and what, what we're going to be focusing on is ensuring that all forces under Iranian uh, uh, control, command and control, need to leave Syria as part of an irreversible political process. That is one of um, Ambassador Jeffrey's top priorities. And so we've got uh, American troops there to ensure the enduring defeat of ISIS. And we have our diplomats there to ensure that Iranian forces do not gain a permanent foothold that, that, that threaten Israel and also would be a threat to American interests in the region beyond, beyond that. So um, the Secretary Pompeo is devoting a great deal of time to Syria um, and I think shares your threat assessment. Sometimes after the Americans will uh, uh, withdraw from the from the agreement, they are not going to violate uh, the agreement, hoping that they they, they they will receive support from uh, Europe, from uh, right. Russia, and from uh, uh, from uh, China. Meanwhile, still this is their uh, uh, still is their position. We try to um, think about scenarios. What what would be the Iranian uh, reaction in the future? We come out with three, maybe obvious, but three uh, scenarios. One, that uh, the Iranians will uh, stick to the status quo and will not violate uh, the agreement for, for uh, hoping that they can survive for some time right. uh, and maybe something will change in the United States and, uh, and the international community will support them because it's the interest of the international community. Another scenario is that they will um, uh, agree to, uh, to uh, some, agree uh, some uh, meetings with the, the Americans, even if they're not going to withdraw from all what they want, 
Then we and another scenario is that they will start uh, gradually to uh, withdraw from the mm -hmm. see, uh, Israel. I think from the Israeli perspective, that this is maybe the most dangerous uh, scenario concerning the new future because they can uh, gain more <coughs> uh, enrichment capabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, uh, once the sanctions are not going, to, are not succeeding to uh, bring them to the table, uh, uh, and are not bringing them to compromise. On the contrary, the, the, uh, the sanctions are uh, forcing them to withdraw or bring them to withdraw from the JCPOA. What will be then the American reaction uh, uh, to this uh, uh, dangerous development from our perspective? Our assessment is Iran has many incentives to stay in the, the nuclear deal. If they were to leave the nuclear deal, the UN multilateral sanctions that were negotiated from 2006 to about 2011 would all come back into place. They would lose, uh, they would lose diplomatic support from Europe and Asia. And if they were to leave the deal and restart their nuclear program, as you mentioned, the United States and Israel would then have the military option back on the table because we will never allow Iran to develop and, and possess a nuclear weapon. So I think, that, I think that it would be such a shock to the system for them to leave the deal. I don't rule it out. It's just that there are many uh, reasons that would, that would argue against leaving the deal. And um, we uh, have had a lot of success. Over 100 major firms have announced that they uh, are canceling uh, planned investments and pulling out of the Iranian market completely. And that is a loss of many, many billions of dollars. Couple that with our all the other sanctions we put in place in August and in November. I think, and, and we've now done 16 rounds of sanctions targeting uh, over 800 individuals and entities, and there will be more to come. And so we're, we're very serious about this campaign of maximum economic pressure. And this regime has done such a, um, they've mismanaged their economy so severely that it's very difficult for them to weather uh, challenging circumstances, and they're not in a good position right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to ask one question yeah. as well. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, thank you so much for your comprehensive uh, review of US policy on Iran. Very helpful for us. Um, I actually want to ask you about uh, what's going on with the Europeans. Um, I know that you led uh, the U.S. team in discussions with the Europeans from February to April. Uh, unfortunately, in the public domain, we don't really know what went on in those uh, uh, discussions. Uh, it would be helpful if we did know uh, what led to the sense that, they, that these talks had you know, not produce the desired result and leading to uh, President Trump's decision to withdraw from the deal. But my question is, you know, where do things stand right now with the Europeans? Is there any indication that the Europeans are willing to, I mean, we see that they're trying to undermine the, the sanctions regime. That's, that's very clear. Mm -hmm. But are there any, you know, uh, things perhaps going on uh, behind the scenes where there's indication that they are willing mm. um, to engage more with the United States? And, and more specifically, this is a question that I keep asking and I'm not getting a response to. I'm wondering what happened to President Macron's four-point plan that he presented to Congress mm -hmm. in late April and which he said would be relevant whether or not President Trump withdrew from the deal. Mm -hmm. So where is this plan? Is he still committed to it? Is anyone committed to it? Let me take that in three parts. I think that was three parts. Um, on, the, um, on, the, on the negotiations with the Europeans to address the deficiencies of the Iran nuclear deal, the President said that we needed to fix um, the sunset clauses, the weak inspections regime, and the absence of ICBMs. And he also called for action on the non-nuclear threats around terrorism, missile proliferation, 
human rights abuses, arbitrary detention of Americans and other foreign nationals. Um, ultimately, it came down to the sunsets. Uh, the Europeans uh, were not comfortable with eliminating the sunset clauses in the Iran nuclear deal. And, um, but otherwise, I think we, we made a great deal of progress around ICBMs and inspections and the other threats that Iran presents to peace and security. But sunsets ended up being uh, the, the bridge that we couldn't build. And so that we, we left the deal. We have, a, uh, as I said in my remarks, we have a great deal more freedom. Uh, the Iran deal gave Iran a lot of freedom and flexibility to be an expansionist revolutionary regime. And at the same time, it limited the freedom and flexibility of the other parties to the deal to address those same threats that the deal enabled. And now that we're out of the deal, uh, it, it's, it's much easier mm -hmm. to go after um, the terrorism, the terror finance, cyber, missile proliferation, uh, threats, the, the maritime threats, it puts us in a much stronger position. And so we've, we've, we've enjoyed the freedom we've had on the other side of the deal. Uh, and I think, that's a, I think that's a consensus that you would hear in Congress as well. Um, there was a split around whether to fix the, you know, get out of the deal, fix the deal, keep the deal as is. But now that we're out of the deal, it really does allow us to take a more targeted approach to addressing all the non-nuclear threats. And Israel has been a great partner in doing that. The second one on, um, I think that with the Europeans, uh, and you know, remember Europe is bigger than the E3. Right. We have, I have discussions with uh, European nations in Central and Eastern Europe and have had very productive discussions with them. I, I meet and talk with the E3 on a very regular basis. I think we share the same threat assessment, but I think that the Iran nuclear deal is something which has, um, has acted as a break on addressing the non-nuclear threats. I think the Iranians know this, and I think they exploit it. So we are very much about um, talking about the, all of the threats that Iran presents to peace and security. Now, the Iran deal is technically called the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, but it is anything but comprehensive. Uh, it is very narrow and limited to only one issue, the nuclear. It doesn't even include ICBMs. And uh, any regime that's ever wanted to become a nuclear weapon state, always. I mean, you never see ICBMs without a nuclear weapons program. So to exclude it, we just think was um, was a big mistake. Um, there is the same threat assessment, but uh, I think there is a, an interest in doing something around the missile proliferation because they see it getting worse. I believe that as Iran creates more forward deployed missile bases, you know, starting in Lebanon and then Syria and Iraq and in Yemen, building this Shia corridor of control that they aspire to, that we are accumulating risk of a regional conflict. And it's very important for us to be getting ahead of that mm -hmm. and to restore deterrence and um, be much more aggressive because Iran is so aggressive about missile proliferation. Um, they have fired, um, I think, well over 100 missiles. The Houthis, supported by the Iranians, have fired over 100, 100 missiles into Saudi Arabia what they're doing in Syria, um, presents a real threat to the region, and it destabilizes it. And then the third question you had was... On Macron's uh, Macron. Yeah. Well, when, when, I think when, when President Macron came in May, I think it was the first week of May, he did talk about this, the four pillars. And if I, I, I'll apologize to the president if I get this wrong, mm -hmm. but the first pillar, I believe, is the JCPOA. And then, then you've got um, three other pillars, which, which have to do with all of the non-nuclear threats to but peace and security. Also, sunset. He actually mentioned sunset there as well. Yeah, it was it was very useful. Uh, we thought it was a very um, uh, it was a step in the right direction, because it was a it was an E3 head of government 
who was talking about the threats that Iran presents beyond the nuclear threat. And my view is that the Iran nuclear deal achieved modest and temporary benefits toward nuclear nonproliferation at the expense of missile proliferation, the, prolif the proliferation of terrorism, terror finance, on and on. So step in the right direction. Um, uh, we're very much looking at the future. Uh, the Iran deal is for us a thing of the past because we've been out of it since May. And we're looking ahead to a truly comprehensive deal, uh, one that will address all the, th uh, the core threats to peace and security that Iran presents and are built around Secretary Pompeo's 12 requirements. Can I ask you a short question? Yeah, of course. Between one and two, what is your assessment that Iran will be ready to reopen the uh, uh, nuclear agreement for future negotiations? We would not be looking to reopen the current agreement. We're out of no, it. A new agreement, okay. A new agreement, yeah. A new agreement, okay. Yeah. What, what, what do I think our odds are? Yeah. Well, I can't speculate on that. But <laughs> historically, uh, uh, because if I give you a number, then I'll get calls from the press asking why we haven't reached our number. But um, historically, Iran comes to the negotiating table when they feel either military or economic pressure. That's how the regime behaves. If, if, if talking nicely to the Iranians worked, we would have solved this 39 years ago. But this is a regime that only responds to military or economic pressure. And um, we're ready to start this. We've already launched it. We've been very happy with the results we've had. The biggest challenge we've had a month or two ago as we were calibrating our sanctions was, was lifting the price of oil because we were taking off so much Iranian crude off the market that we needed to be really careful about not taking off too much and then sending oil to 90 or $100 a barrel. And President Trump has talked about this. Um, a lot of analysts projected that we would take off 300,000 barrels of oil. That's after our sanctions went into effect. We took off a million before they went into effect. And it's going to get a lot worse. And, we have a, and, and next year, we're going to have a much better supplied oil market which allows us to accelerate our path to zero. I think we can take a question from Shlomo yeah. and Eldad, and then we'll wrap up. Well, not only the European states, but all other uh, P5 plus one signatories to the agreement, so all signals, uh, withdrawal and the resumption of sanctions. Mm -hmm. And some of them may take active uh, uh, steps to, to derail An idea is considered between uh, Russia and Iran that Russia will buy Iranian uh, oil and will supply yeah. its own oil to the European Union, for example. Right. How you are going to deal with the problem that uh, that arising because of uh, the lack of cooperation of the other P5 plus one? But we've only seen cooperation so far, and anything that we've seen about what you're describing has all been rhetorical. When you look at the data, which is what we look at, the data is very powerful. Over 100 firms leaving, million barrels off the market, 20 nations that prior to May were importing Iranian crude oil are now at zero. We are only seeing strong, and also the capital flight leaving Iran plus the collapse of the Rial. There's a lot happening right now. And when, when we see statements in the press, I mean, Russia is very good at, at over-egging the pudding. And so um, we just, we don't, we don't really give a lot of thought to these, so a lot of the rhetorical statements. We will sanction any sanctionable activity we see. And so if there are efforts to buy Iranian crude and do ship-to-ship -ship transfers or launder it, turn it into something else, we will sanction everybody involved in that supply chain. And then? Uh, there are a lot of analysts uh, around the world that uh, think, assess that maybe the real objective of the U.S. is to bring uh, regime change in, in Iran. Hmm. My question is not if it's true. 
Oh, you're the first well, one, you're the first one yeah. not to ask oh, it. <laughs> okay, that's my, fine. That's my fine. question is different. My question is, let, let, let's take this hypothetic scenario that the, this regime will face uh, severe ch internal challenges yeah. because of the um, deteriorated economy. Yeah. How we make sure, or how the U.S. will make sure that the next regime, or the next yeah. administration regime in, in Iran will be a moderate regime that will base its policy on a new uh, objective than this current regime? Um, Iran has, uh, the Iranian people have made various attempts at a true representative government since 1905. And there have been highs and lows since 1905. But we do believe that the Iranian people aspire to a government that represents them. This regime does a very bad job of representing the Iranian people. I think the United States uh, does more to stand with the Iranian people than the Iranian regime does. And we've been consistent in our support of uh, Iranians who take to the streets or protest silently from their own homes about how this regime treats its own people. And it is true, as the president has said, that the longest suffering victims of the Iranian regime are the Iranian people. The um, the Ayatollah is in his 80s. Uh, it is very hard to predict uh, what comes next. Uh, that's not something that we're in the business of doing. Um, what we try to do is support the Iranian people, and the future of the Iranian regime is up to the Iranian people. I think what we find is that a lot of what the Iranian people are asking for from their government are the same things that we're asking. We want them out of Syria. So do the Iranian people. We want a regime that doesn't rob its people blind. So, and we would rather have them spend the sanctions relief on the Iranian people than spend it. They spent $16 billion since 2013 in Syria, Iraq, and Yemen, supporting all sorts of malign activity. $700 million a year to Lebanese Hezbollah, $100 million a year to Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. That's money that uh, intensifies, prolongs, and deepens a conflict. And if we can dry up that revenue and force the regime to focus on its own people and stop behaving like a revolutionary regime, it would contribute not only to Israel's stability and security. Uh, imagine if we can dry up those revenue flows to Hamas. Be a big deal. So we, um, those are the things that we want to talk about in a new deal. You know, to dry up that revenue. Um, but as I said, the Iranian people have been trying for over 100 years, and they have had um, very strong moments in its history of representative government. This is not one of those times. Uh, we hope that our sanctions regime is going to put the kind of pressure on the regime so that it has to start making better decisions about how it spends its money. And um, the United States is the largest donor of humanitarian assistance in the world. Uh, we, very, we, we make very clear to banks that they should facilitate the sale of humanitarian assistance. The Iranian regime creates front, front companies to divert humanitarian assistance to make sure that it doesn't get to the Iranian people and they blame the United States. But we know from polling that the Iranian people know uh, whom to blame for their economic troubles. And uh, President Rouhani, since 2013, has made, repeat, made repeated promises to fix the economy, and it's only gotten worse. So when you see the polling, the press always thinks that, you know, they always ask me this question, you know, why are you hurting the Iranian people? The Iranian people know who's hurting them. It's the regime. It's not the United States. Well, thank you so okay, much. Okay, thank you. This, yeah, this sure. has been excellent and very, very helpful for yeah. our ongoing yeah, research good. into these good. issues. So Great. Thank you, thank so you for much having for me. Coming. Good. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Thank you.